to support its use. So, um, purpose is uh, to describe, the, for the talk is to describe the ventilation in infants and children, identify evidence-based indications for effective use of NIF or non invasive ventilation in human chronic care settings, identify possible predictors of NIF success or failure in its complications, recommend future research needed to improve outcomes of NIF in the acute care setting, and also its use in the chronic care settings of those who may need home non-invasive ventilation. So, um, all right, so this is basic physiology. Um, this is actually what we should it's a, a, high, a, a physiologic alveolus that we think about. Um, this is a pressure volume curve. So when we try to ventilate, our aim is to, if somebody it has atelectasis or has stiff lungs full of secretions, the lung usually is in this stage. For those who have asthma, um, air trapping, the lung is usually here, it's inflated. So this is atelectasis hyperinflation. We aim to ventilate our patient in this area so we don't underventilate that may precipitate uh, atelectasis. We don't overventilate that may cause barotrauma. Those with mild RDS, big preterms, 
patients with renal pneumonia, uh, and also can be used um, as an interface uh, post extubation after surfactant. Um, it shortens intubation time, um, um, and um, and also as a bridge um, um, to prevent failure of uh, extubation. Also, it prevents us from um, invasively intubating patients when they can actually get better with nasal support. Um, also, in infants in PICU, where um, who may come in with pneumonia, bronchiolitis, um, pneumonia, um, in asthma, it has also been applied in some hospitals. It's, um, there are other randomized control trials undergoing at this time about this efficacy. And also in older children, we've had encounters, encountered patients who are near drowning, coming from emergency room, where instead of just giving oxygen, they're given non-invasive ventilation or BiPAP. And it actually prevents them from being intubated and preventing them from progressing to acute respiratory failure. Also, has been described in adults, uh, in patients with pulmonary edema, uh, with congestive heart failure, um, just to, um, with those who have um, um, uh, pulmonary edema, um, it, uh, positive pressure can help uh, recruit the alveoli and um, um, as a modality to uh, improve their edema. Also for atelectasis, pneumonia, and uh, obstructive lung disease. And for those who come in with acute exacerbation of their chronic lung disease. So uh, mechanism of action, uh, non-invasive ventilation, um, can provide stability for the chest wall, especially for those who have neuromuscular weakness. Um, it, it undoes the diaphragm and accessory muscles, especially for those who have stiff lungs or for those who have um, um, neuromuscular weakness. Um, it increases functional residual capacity because it stents the airways, it also stents the alveoli, um, preventing atelectasis. Uh, functional residual capacity is the amount of air in the lung after <coughs> exhalation. And if patients have pneumonia, usually they're at, uh, at risk for um, atelectasis and mucus plugging and uh, non-invasive to release of ventilation seems to be helpful from that standpoint too. Maintain upper airway patency, it stands the upper airway from the pressure that it gives, um, and also decrease apnea and hypopnea among the young age group. <coughs> So um, in this study, uh, this is a landmark study from CHESS. It was uh, done by uh, intensivists from, um, I think, um, Augusta, uh, from, from Atlanta, Georgia, see, 1995, where they, uh, in, a, in the PIC setting, uh, as early as 1995, they were able to use bilevel nasal mass positive pressure ventilation in their patients. And, um, the outcomes they have, well, if you can see, um, the medium duration of nasal ventilation is 72 hours. Um, and then physiologic parameters were followed. Um, and it includes um, measurement within an hour before and after starting the non invasive ventilation. And they found that within an hour, they're able to find physiologic decrease in the respiratory rate, um, the arterial blood gas, oxygenation improvement, uh, also um, CO2 um, decrease, and improvement in pH, which were all significantly significant, uh, uh, statistically significant. Um, also, uh, other parameters they, they use to measure include the AA gradient and the PAO2, FiO2 ratio. The AA gradient is a measure of lung disease. So normal is up to 15, so anything above high means there's ventilation, perfusion mismatch, and uh, uh, hypoxemia. So there's improvement in the AA gradient and also the PA to FIO2 ratio based on this study. So in the past, they were using low pressures. This being a landmark study, so as low as 10 over five, um, and this is a um, res retrospective um, series. There are different cases here. Some of them have chronic um, like neurologically um, impaired patients, those with neuromuscular disease, or some um, development delay, but the majority of them have pneumonia in acute exacerbation. But, but, and, and you see with non-invasive ventilation, most of them have survived. So it's an option that's available, and there's evidence for its use. Um, potential benefits, um, avoidance of risk of intubation, 
um, and intubation, although it's life-saving, if we give too much pressure, it can, patients can go through the pneumothorax. Also airway trauma, if let's say they use the wrong tube, patients can have uh, airway granuloma in the upper airways of subglottic stenosis complications. Um, um, and also uh, not intubating patients, and if are able to improve patients, can decrease uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, decrease the uh, decrease risk of acquired neuromuscular weakness from prolonged sedation. Um, also, potential decrease in ICU length of stay and mortality and decreased cost, which is good for some hospitals because uh, right now we're trying to cut costs and be more efficient in the care in, in the least um, uh, in the most efficient way in for, uh, to improve our patient uh, care. Um, so the others here for chronic care, uh, non-invasive ventilation has also been used in our, in our patients, especially for patients with uh, neuromuscular weakness. Majority, I, I work in a center where we deal with a lot of the shame muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy who have used um, non-invasive ventilation at night because sleep is a physiologic, um, is a physiologic um, challenge. So when they sleep, they get uh, relief from their um, work of breathing by using non-invasive ventilation, so they have more um, put more stamina, more energy when they wake up in the morning because they have less CO2 retention, improved gas exchange and oxygenation. Also at night, it's a physiologic challenge um, when they're weak. Um, we are, patients are prone to have uh, atelectasis at night, so using non-invasive ventilation can also help prevent atelectasis acquired during sleep and also improve their weight. Um, high flow nasal cannula has, has uh, been been popular um, over the past five to ten years. Um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly for the interest of time. Um, and uh, non-invasive ventilation can come as pressure controlled, um, can be given through nasal interface um, cannula. Um, Non-invasive ventilation can also be given through the laryngeal mask, nasal mask, and the full face mask. So this is an example of our um, um, in, uh, pick a patient in the intermediate care nursery. It's a newborn with um, uh, transient to kidney of newborn um, was refractory to um, nasal cannula. Um, nasal cannula, anything above one liters per minute is considered high flow. But if that doesn't work, and patient continues to have CO2 retention and uh, low pH, um, then non um, nasal CPAP can be offered. So there's an interface called NeoRAM, where it looks like a nasal cannula, but actually it can interface with the ventilator. So here we're giving a CPAP of five, and 70% um, FIO2. But anyway, so that's, um, um, it's, it's doable and it works well. That prevents patients from progressing to respiratory failure. Now, this is in the PICU, a uh, patient who came in with acute, first with viral bronchiolitis and having secondary bacterial pneumonia, did not respond well to nasal cannula. So, patient is awake, as you can see, um, and is attached to a ventilator. Uh, we're giving um, <coughs> uh, a PIP of uh, 15 over uh, 6, a uh, rate of 20. Um, and assigned the mode 30% FIO2. And patients seem to be very comfortable with that. <clears throat> so here's another um, uh, slide to show non invasive ventilation can be given through a laryngeal mask. As you see, we had a patient at some point when we had micronathia, um, was aspirating, chronic aspiration pneumonia, um, couldn't be intubated despite um, sedation. So we ended up putting a laryngeal mask and um, was able to wait till the next day until we have a uh, scheduled uh, patient for a G2 placement. But this happened in the middle of the night and we were able to ventilate patient and stable enough to go to surgery. So as you can see in the, the patient to, uh, to the patient I showed earlier, Ivan made ventilation and NIBBB came in with you know, left, left lung almost white out and we're able to recruit the lungs, open it up without needing intubation, see the improvement from capacity to like uh, recruiting and seeing some lung tissue uh, being recruited. So 
so that's that patient. Um, there's supposed to be a video there, but it doesn't work. All right, so um, outcomes. In, in neonates, uh, there's been a um, comparison between um, the use of nasal CPAP versus NIPPP. As you can see, um, again, it depends on the pr how much pressure you give. Um, there's been not, no statistical significance in um, these parameters in terms of use of nasal CPAP versus NIPPP. Okay, so high flow nasal cannula. Um, um, I think in GRPC you have this at your emergency room. Um, so high flow nasal cannula is not available. Um, it give, it's like a modified uh, auto blender, but at the same time it can give humidification, which is more physiologic and also um, warmed, uh, which is uh, uh, favorable for the airways. So high flow nasal uh, uh, cannula um, stands out from um, uh, conventional ventilation um, because it provides heated humidified airflow. At the same time, um, even though uh, even though it's helpful, we should also remember that it also gives positive pressure. And um, be careful as well in choosing the pressure that we give because it can uh, also uh, cause pneumothorax in the style in some cases. So we uh, make sure, we also want to make sure that we don't uh, have a, a full seal in the nose. So there's uh, a little bit of a uh, leak to prevent um, air trapping. Um, so we need to use the appropriate size prong um, to occlude the nostril, um, prevent air trapping, but at the same time be able to um, achieve our goal of ventilating appropriately. Okay, so um, um, high flow nasal cannula not only provides um, um, oxygenation, it can also cause washout of uh, CO2 in the dead space um, here. Here. So um, if, if the high flow exceeds patient's demand and um, provides washout of for the dead space, um, it also has more efficient gas exchange. It can also remove carbon dioxide at the same time improve delivery of oxygen. So this area can also be a reservoir for more oxygen to be delivered. So it's more efficient in giving oxygenation. It can give, even give as much as 100% to high flow nasal cannula. Um, so this is a mechanism. Um, it's just, um, just a schematic diagram um, where the air um, is heated and humidified before it goes to the patient. There's also a filter somewhere here to prevent um, infection um, uh, going to the patient. Um, this is a retrospective study um, by McKiernan and his colleagues um, about the efficacy of high flow nasal cannula in infants with bronchiolitis. Um, so they compared what they did the season before and the season after when they used high flow nasal cannula. And they found that there's a, the rate of intubation in PICU was um, decreased only 9% compared to 23%, which is statistically significant. So it's helpful. Um, and uh, decreases um, PICU stay decreased from six to four days after the introduction of high flow nasal cannula. So it decreased. So it's uh, more efficient, it decreased costs. And this is a pilot study as well that shows um, also benefits of uh, high flow nasal cannula um, in infants. So um, what they found here, um, the group of patients, um, there's not no statistically significant in terms of their characters for those who have high flow nasal cannula versus standard treatment of nasal cannula. But if, if you want to find out whether high flow nasal cannula is effective, Physiologic parameters such as heart rate and respiratory weight can be assessed in different time segments. And in this study, they have found that um, within an hour, you'll see difference for those responders and non-responders. So you can differentiate from the emergency room who is going to benefit from high flow nasal cannula by um, looking at parameters, respiratory rate, improvement in respiratory rate, and heart rate. Uh, those are the ones who would respond to high flow nasal cannula. Um, can 
All right. So um, high flow diesel cannula advantage would be humidification, higher FiO2. Another proposed mechanism is wash out this for no dead space, which we have discussed. Um, and also, it can ask, uh, act as a poor man's CPAP. Um, studies have been um, done in the past wherein they, they measured, me measured flows of three years to five years in term, in term and pre terms, have shown that CPAP measured ranges from 1.7 to 4.8 centimeter water. So giving high flow diesel cannula can give PEEP. So that's the advantage. Um, it's a less invasive way of providing CPAP than conventional nasal pharyngeal nasal CPAP and um, reduce need for invasive ventilation. All right, so outcomes, we all have positive outcomes. So um, something that we are trying to acquire at GMH, um, something that we would like to uh, use in the emergency room, preventing them from being admitted in the pediatric ICU and prevent them from progressing into full-blown respiratory failure by, by um, initiating this form of non-invasive ventilation. So there have been studies um, in um, uh, uh, in, New, in the New England area where they found that um, introducing hydronasal cannula in the pediatric ward rather than the PICU decreases um, the number of days patients stay in the hospital. So if I can share this with you, these are protocols for the different age groups. You want to ask how much high flow can you give? So each age group is different. Two years and above for infants, less than six months. But remember, in, in the neonates, it's more than one liter is considered high flow. One, one month to six months is two liters to um, eight. Six to 18 months is four to 12. And one to 18 months is eight to 15 liters per minute. Anything beyond that, you will be at risk for viral trauma. So using high flow nasal cannula decreases hospitalization um, stay and decrease um, cost. Now moving on, uh, non-invasive ventilation um, from the ARDS network, they have already, um, is a consensus panel on finding the benefit of the use of high flow nasal, uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation in patients with um, impending respiratory failure, acute hypostemic respiratory failure. So it has been discussed among this um, group, um, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, so nasal mass and CPAP. Um, for those who are requiring more than 40% and maintaining 88 to 97% of FiO2. Um, so they've um, concluded, based on the review of studies, which are mostly retrospective, that the use of uh, non invasive ventilation is a modality that can be used in milder, milder uh, cases of um, uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. Because in the studies that they, this, um, they, uh, like the Cochrane study review, that those who are offered non-based ventilation, those with septic shock um, and high hemodynamic compromise won't benefit from non-based ventilation. So, but it can be used for those who are in the milder range of hypoxic respiratory failure and CO2 retention. So a uh, uh, case we had Toby old near drowning came from the hospital. Um, initially, we started on low, um, low pressures, 10 over 4, bi-level, um, uh, ST mode, rate of 10, 20% FiO2, patient had CO2 retention and hypoxemia. But by just increasing the pressure, um, obviously increasing FiO2, um, patient benefited, actually prevented patients from having ARDS, prevented and, and have improvement, stayed on your PIC for two days. So this is when we received the patient from the other hospital, um, you know, both bilateral um, um, infiltrates from near down in salt water and an improvement after two days with non based ventilation. Secondary bacterial pneumonia with the, with the use of non invasive positive pressure ventilation, bilateral infiltrates. In fact, the pH of this patient was 7.1, CO2 of 90s. With this x ray, and thankfully, the hospital is on call at that time, tried nasal CPAP, a simple as nasal CPAP of 6 centimeter water. And the blood gases improved to 7.2 60s of CO2 and improvement eventually of lung parenchyma just by intervention of nasal CPAP. But um, even though we start with the nasal CPAP rather than bilevel positive air pressure ventilation, we need to follow our parameters with 
physiologic parameters such as respiratory rate, heart rate, and also blood gas improvement to see if our, our, our intervention is, um, is appropriate. If not, we can always escalate to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. It's a modality. So um, there are journals out there that can support the use of non-invasive ventilation. All they say is we need team, team training on our staff, the respiratory therapists, in the use of the appropriate mask and the use of the pressures. Um, but it's a modality that can be offered to those with acute respiratory failure uh, insufficiency with hypoxemia. This is an adult study. This is very insightful, and hopefully we'll see this in pediatrics, where in the, they use the FI, PaO2, FiO2 ratio as a parameter of improvement. So um, and, um, for ARDS, as you can see, within an hour of use of non-invasive ventilation, you can see the difference of those who will respond Responders usually would respond within an hour of use using improvement in the PaO2 and FiO2. So if you're gonna choose, if you wanna escalate your treatment, you can use these physiologic parameters to advance. Um, anyway, so this you can Google, this is um, um, non-invasive ventilation which we use in the hospital, hospital grade, um, wherein um, we use full face mask. Actually for our pediatric group, we use the adult nasal mask that would just fit the full face of the patient. Um, so it's doable. It can be used for any kids more than 20 kilograms. This is a uh, um, hospital grade non-invasive ventilator, P uh, V60 by Respironics. That's the only that, um, non-invasive ventilator we have. This can be used for invasive ventilation. Now we're trying to acquire this one. It's a non-invasive ventilation sink, non-invasive a ventilator that can be used non-invasively and also for endotracheal intubation. Um, it can be used for kids more than five kilograms. It can be used also for transport. Um, so again, it has modalities for non-invasive ventilation and also for invasive ventilation. Wide range of pressures it can be used. Uh, it can also be used for volume control, pressure control, um, pressure support as well. All right, I need to finish up very quickly. But uh, non-invasive ventilation was initially intended for patients with chronic respiratory failure and for home ventilation. Um, it assists respiratory muscles, nocturnal hypercalibria, improve daytime respiratory gas exchange, prevent atelectasis, and improve upper airway patency. And we can just read all these in the textbook. Um, most um, helpful would be for the neuromuscular weakness patients. Also with obesity hyperventilation syndrome we're in, the obese population have stiff chest walls because of their fat pads, and also the fat pads on the upper airway and the non-invasive ventilation seem to help open up their airways and also improve inflation of their lungs just in case they have hyperventilation at night. Also for those with chronic upper airway obstruction to set the airways open. Um, so we discussed majority of them, we discussed acute care, in a chronic care setting, uh, use of non-invasive ventilation in OSA, and muscular weakness, Down syndrome. I just want to emphasize, in pediatrics, if, if you have a sleep study that shows obstructive sleep apnea, the first line of therapy is actually adenoconsular uh, uh, adenoidectomy. It's only those patients who have absolute contraindications for surgery, like bleeders, those who have um, facial dysmorphism, um, or Jehovah's Witness who don't want um, transfusion, that you would offer non-invasive ventilation. So I urge you, if you have a patient, pediatric patient with OSA, the first line is removal of tonsils and adenoids. If that doesn't work, if they still have an abnormal sleep study, that's the time to offer non-invasive ventilation. So other mask interfaces that are now available, it's kit friendly, it can have many designs as well, less obst uh, obstruction of the face more tolerable, um, clear line of sight for kids. So these are the uh, machines we used to have, the restaurants, BiPAP, which is noisy, it's not digital, uh, no humidifier, but now we have high grade non-invasive ventilators out there uh, where you can have humidification, which is digital, you can track the patient's use, uh, whether they're compliant or not. Um, so they can also have uh, filters to prevent uh, um, microbiologic filter to prevent uh, infection and also an O2 port just in case you give pressure and they still are hypoxemic so they can, um, um, the ventilators right now are more vers versatile and um, um, user friendly. All right, so 
other masks available. There are now many mask interfaces that are available for kids and adults. So to recap, when we try to ventilate, we don't want to underventilate or overventilate. We want to try to be in this neutral or more um, physiologic, uh, more stable um, pressures um, to recruit lungs, give pressure to inflate uh, the lungs without causing any trauma. All right, contraindications um, for lung based ventilation would be apnea, hemodynamic instability, those with septic shock, refractory hypoxemia, impaired mental status, inability to handle oral secretions, those who need more, uh, a lot of, su of suctioning, uh, may need intubation, inability to protect airways from aspiration, those uh, uh, neurologic, um, uh, neurologically uh, developmentally debate patients who are aspirators, you distend the gastric, uh, um, uh, the stomach, and make them aspirate more. Um, those with GI debate, acute facial trauma, and coin atresia, uh, which are um, self explanatory. And mouth closure is important in order to maintain adequate pressures. There are many ways to keep the mouth closed. In babies, we can use a pacifier. In adults or younger or older age group, we can use a chin strap. Uh, complications of nib, irritation of the skin and eyes, nasal congestion, dry nose and snacks, and sore throat, viral trauma, gastric distension, aspiration, and acute and recognized deterioration. Um, gastric distension, um, gastric sphincter can open up if you give pressures of as much as 25. Um, so, so now we've gone. Okay, so I'm done. So as a recap, I hope we were able to identify evidence-based indications for the effective use of non-invasive ventilation in the acute care and chronic care settings. Identify possible predictors of NIP success and failure. Remember, within an hour, you can tell if they are going to be successful or not using physiologic parameters. And um, also, no complications. I recommend future research to improve outcome of NIP in the acute care setting, especially in the emergency room. Uh, in a I, I 